Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it a gorgeous day out there? <laughs> the American Bible commentators call this Super Bowl Sunday in the liturgical life of the church. <laughs> For all you Super Bowl fans out there, I hope it's a great day. But it's actually the sixth Sunday after Epiphany or the sixth Sunday in Epiphany. And as we celebrate uh, the prayers that you just heard, uh, spiritual music are in recognition of February being Black History Month. And it's an important piece of our history, an important piece to take notice of and to pause and to think about the folks that uh, were in our countries, both uh, Canada and the United States in the early days and in this day as well, and be cognizant of the struggles that they've had to face in a variety of different ways. Um, in the service today, you'll see the Sanctus says that it said, it's actually going to be sung. <laughs> so uh, we won't, we won't uh, remind you of that as we do it because we don't like to break up the Eucharistic service at that point, so just be prepared that we'll sing through that. And I think that's really it for announcements or anything else like that. So we'll just focus our minds on God and the opening sentence for this day is rejoice. Leap for joy, for behold, your reward, your reward is great in heaven. As we have a quiet moment of preparation. Feast usually, and 
uh, we give thanks for the journey of reconciliation that we're on. And as we begin in worship, we continue that acknowledgement. In this time and place, we gather on the ancestral lands of the Wasanic and Coast Salish peoples. From many places and peoples, we come to this house in prayer. In this time and place, we are not alone, for we meet in the presence of the living God. For we meet in the presence of the living God. In this time and in this place, we are not alone, for the risen Jesus stands in our midst. The risen Jesus stands in our midst. In this time and space, we are not alone, for the wind of the Spirit moves in and through us. The wind of the Spirit moves in and through us. In this time and space, we are not alone, for we gather with the whole company of heaven. In this time and in this space, heaven and earth are one. In this time and in this space, heaven and earth are one. In this time and place together, one people in Jesus Christ. In the name of God, Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus Christ healed the sick and restored them to wholeness of life. Look with compassion on the anguish of the world, and by your power make whole all peoples and all nations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
May God be with you. And also with you. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus according to Luke. Glory to you, Jesus Christ. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of Christ. Praise, Praise to you, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Please be seated. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you, O God. So before I begin speaking today, I'm going to challenge us to listen, to stop and listen for a few moments. I know we already had that moment of silence, but let's do it again. Let's take a moment to listen. Here are some thoughts that may have just gone through your mind. <clears throat> this is uncomfortable. When is she going to start talking? <laughs> I don't hear anything. What are we listening for? This is so peaceful. I wish I spent more time in silence listening. Lord, what is happening to the world? Have you stopped speaking to us? Should have watched that next episode on Netflix last Netflix last night. It was such a cliffhanger. <laughs> How am I going to help my daughter get through this pain? Will everything be all right? Listening can be a complex practice. It can be uncomfortable, enlightening, difficult, or peaceful, depending on who we are listening to and who we are listening with. In our reading today, there are three wise men, and not the ones you're thinking of, but these three wise men tell us to listen. The first is the prophet Jeremiah, who says, Thus says the Lord, a proclamation made by prophets, which means, Hey, listen up, God is speaking, pay attention. And then Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, says, How can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, hey, haven't you been paying attention to and listening to what I have been telling you? And lastly, in the gospel, we are told that a multitude of people come to hear and to listen to Jesus. So in my sermon today, I'm going to talk about three aspects of listening. 
And you may have realized uh, by now that I'm not much of a three-step preacher, so these forms of listening will be intertwined and interwoven into this sermon. But I'm hoping that this will help you to pay attention and listen to my words. So the three aspects we will explore are who we are called to listen to, who we are called to listen with, and what we are meant to hear. So we'll say those again. Who we are called to listen to, who we are called to listen with, and what we are meant to hear. So the gospel today begins with the question, who are we to listen with? The picture is painted of a multitude of people gathering to listen to Jesus, and they come from all over the place. And we are told that they come to hear him. Now, it seems on the surface like a beautiful day. People are being healed, and they're just listening to some wise words of Jesus. However, Luke is really sneaky in his wording. He just casually mentions that there are people there from Tyre and Sidon. Now, people from Tyre and Sidon were Gentiles, and they were the bitterest enemies of the Jews. These Gentiles were not casual onlookers. They were followers of Jesus. So even from the beginning, if we really listen, we hear that Jesus is setting the stage for the message he is about to proclaim. The message that all people, even the most unexpected, are welcome to follow him. And then Jesus turns his attention towards his disciples, who will one day be the witnesses of his preaching, teaching, and healing. This gospel passage is early on in his ministry, so these words are like a training manual for his disciples. He's not telling them to act and do these things. That will come later. For now, he is telling them to listen, to truly try and understand what this ministry is about. Jesus, in his sermon, touches on the realities of the disciples in that day. You see, the disciples were not rich people. They relied on God for all that they required. And I actually think this is a really important point. I will confess that I have often read this passage, this gospel, as a person with privilege. And I hold feelings of guilt for my status in this world. Woe to you who are rich, and I am rich. However, Jesus hung out with the rich and the poor, the tax collectors and the prostitutes. It's important for us to remember that Jesus is not classist. What he is trying to say in the sermon is that if you are going to follow me, you need to rely on God for all things. And for those of us who have all that we need financially and materially, we know that relying on God for all things can be a challenge. Now, don't get me wrong, I think if we truly listen to this passage and allow ourselves to hear it, it should make us uncomfortable and challenge us to be people of radical love, justice, and care for all. However, I'm going to challenge you to go a step deeper this morning. I would say that Jesus here is speaking about the larger concept of the kingdom of God. Not just the one that exists here and now, but the one that is to come. Paul in 1 Corinthians is asking the church of Corinth to keep their faith, even about something as wild as Jesus being resurrected from the dead. Paul understands the upside-downness of the kingdom of God. He understands that people of faith have the ability to believe that even in the darkest moments there is hope. That even when the world says a person, a life, a situation is irredeemable, there is new life in Jesus. Paul says, if you do not believe in something as miraculous and unbelievable as life beyond death, then what is even the point? Jesus is calling us to be a people of faith, to strive for a kingdom that turns everything on its head, both here and now and in the time to come, to be a people of hope who listen to those who need to hear the good news and welcome all into God's loving arms. Now I would like to move on to the prophet Jeremiah another person that God asks us to listen to today. And I want to talk about Jeremiah because I think many of us can actually relate to him. You see, God clearly called Jeremiah to be a prophet. And he did become a prophet, but he was not happy about it. (laughs) Some scholars say he resisted because he was only a child when he was called. He was actually quite young. However, others say he saw too clearly the cost of the prophetic office and simply shrank from what he knew was in store for him. Now, how do I mean the latter? I wonder if you have ever heard God say, Hey, you, listen, I want you to do blank. 
blank. It could be something as simple as stopping and listening to the person God has placed in front of you. Or perhaps it was something that was so upside down from the door that your bravery left you in the moment. For many of us, even the call to become a Christian, be baptized, and commit ourselves to community was a call we did not want to listen to. Thankfully, Jeremiah tells us that God searches the heart and will never leave us even when we choose not to listen. So I'm going to admit to you now that I, like Jeremiah, have at times been reluctant to listen to God's call. Those of you who know my story know that I was called to ordain ministry very early in life. I was probably about the same age as Jeremiah. And then I tucked this calling in my back pocket and I went on with my life. My career was working with street-involved people, which included people experiencing homelessness, mental health struggles, and addiction. And in this messy, vulnerable, honest, and painful community, I felt a vocational call. I learned much about listening to and listening with a community that society often rejects. About five years ago, I was offered a full-time job in a parish as a lay program director. And like Jeremiah, I was very conflicted. I remembered that call I had received as a preteen to serve the church. And yet at the same time, I felt that it was wrong to leave my work with the poor. After all, isn't that what God tells us to do in Scripture? What I quickly came to realize is that through my baptismal covenant with God, I made the promise to say yes when God said, follow me. As a Christian, I was no longer the one calling the shots. And I recognized that listening to God had never steered me wrong before. So long story short, doors closed, a very clear pathway began to emerge, and now I am here with you today uh, following a call to ordained ministry. The reluctant prophet Jeremiah has been described as a man of great spiritual insight, death, a man of driving eloquence who was possessed of unusual poetic gifts, and we definitely see that in the reading today. His words of speaking to a specific time in history have become timeless. They echo the words of Jesus in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. And cursed are those who trust in mere mortals, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. Now, I find this language a little bit strong, but I'm going to give Jeremiah credit. Because he was trying to get across a point to a group of people who were not listening to God. His message is clear. Listen to God. Follow the ways of Yahweh, and you will have abundant life. Jesus, Jeremiah spoke to the upside-downness of Jesus' ministry. To follow God and to listen to God, even when the world is telling you otherwise. So why is this topic of listening so important in our world today? We live in a society filled with noise. James Howell, in his book, The Beatitudes for Today, explains that when we listen to scripture, the noise that overwhelms our culture tends to distract us from what is being said. He writes that we are swamped in a backwash of words, ideas, sound bites, half-truths, and slogans. With social media, the internet, and TV, we are offered opinions from every end of the spectrum, with little guidance as to what the truth really is. We are confronted daily with the divided nature of our communities, the country, and the wider world. So yesterday, as I heard the trucks careening down my block, loudly honking their horns for hours on the way to the parliament buildings, I felt anger bubble up inside me. And I said, I don't think this is what Jesus is calling me to listen to. <laughs> but the words of Howell came to my mind. We need to bracket out the sound so that we might actually be able to hear the upside downness of Jesus' words. Now, I don't think he was talking about the horns of angry protesters, but his words did make me pause. I wonder how God is calling us to listen in a world which longs to be heard, to hear the stories of those who God creates and loves, and let's go of the labels we love so much, such as poor, rich, liberal, conservative, atheist, Christian, right, wrong. This must be one of the hardest things that God is calling us to. However, we know all too well the damage that can be done when we stop listening to others and start believing that what we have is all right. 
This does not mean we allow evil to persist, but in listening to others, we begin to see that all stories are as complex as the people who live them. So I'm going to leave you with the words of another man who is not in scripture, but I think we should all listen to it. His name is Henry now, and he's a Catholic priest who has now passed away. And he speaks of listening as spiritual hospitality. He says, to listen is very hard because it asks of us so much interior stability that we no longer need to prove ourselves by speeches, arguments, statements, or declarations. True listeners no longer have an inner need to make their presence known. They are free to receive, to welcome, to accept. Listening is so much more than allowing another to talk while waiting for a chance to respond. Listening is paying full attention to others and welcoming them into our very beings. The beauty of listening is that those who are listened to start feeling accepted, start taking their words more seriously, and discovering their own true selves. Listening is a form of spiritual hospitality by which you invite strangers to become friends, to get to know their inner selves more fully, and even dare to be silent with you. So let us listen to the words of Paul, of Jeremiah, and of Jesus today. Amen. Amen. So we absorb the words of Scripture and the words of the sermon of Leslie. Let us confess the faith for our baptism as we say. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Virgin's God, was crucified, and died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. God welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be like in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all of your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Stand and see. Wish. The peace of God be with you always. And also.
receive all we offer you this day and turn our sickness into health and our sorrow into joy. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, who is not working in us and in the more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, our brother, our companion on the journey, and the blessing of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and those for whom you pray, this day and forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.